Hello everyone, welcome to Liam's Lyceum, I'm your host Liam, aka Himbar, and today I have another video of recommending short stories to you. This is inspired by Short Story September, uh, which was kind of put together by She Is Only Evie, um, well, Evie from She Is Only Evie's uh, channel, uh, and this is where I'm just talking about 25 short stories I read in September, essentially. I'm going to tell you about them, a little bit of my thoughts, and see if maybe you're interested um, in reading them. Um, so... I, this is going to include golden age sci-fi, it's going to include some fantasy, uh, some horror, um, some cyberpunk uh, this time around, and some other things. We'll just see what we have. So I do list all the short stories in the description down below. I don't timestamp them because I don't have time to edit like any of my videos, and I know some people probably find that extremely frustrating. Um, listen to this on two times speed if you want, though. Uh, and if you need help again, of course, finding any of these short stories and where to read them, uh, then I can help you with that. Just tell me, essentially. So number one for this episode of 25 uh, is Sir Milk in Blood by Michael Moorcock. This is a 1996 story, I believe, because it was first released. I actually have my collection right here, so I'll show you. Um, in Ponds of Chaos, um, Tales of the Eternal Champion. It's the very first story in here. It's tiny. And it's actually a story of Zenith, the albino, um, who... I didn't actually realize until reading this that he had used as an eternal champion. It's kind of, he's very similar to Von Beck uh, and Alric. He's, an, you know, an albino, of course. But Zenith the albino is actually a character created um, over 100 years ago, um, not by Morcock, of course. Um, that was the inspiration for Alric, actually. So uh, he's a villain in some old detective stuff. I forget who the, the detective is, but they're rather famous. Um though not as famous as, you know, uh, Sherlock. But uh, Sue Malcolm Blood, very short, very fun, uh, this kind of uh, messed up psychopathic Zenith the Albino with a awesome sword. Uh, involves some terrorist attack as well, but again, it's very short. Don't need to go much into it. Um, number two is A Logic Named Joe by Murray Leinster or Leinster or something like that. It came out in 1946. So what's cool about this story is that uh, it's called A Logic Named Joe. So A Logic was one of the terms that we might have had for computer. Um, if you remember, oh, well, back in the day when computers were first getting invented, we, we settled on computer eventually. Uh, computer was also someone who computed stuff, right? So uh, someone who put stuff into a computer. Um, and uh, a logic, a logic was one of those old names for a computer. We don't use that anymore though. So these logics in this story kind of can answer any question that, that you have, unless it's going to prove a danger to someone and then their system doesn't allow it well this gets messed up when all these logics start answering these questions and people start killing each other essentially because these logics tell them how to um, and there's one named joe who has the right programming essentially and he's going to save the world essentially so it's not a, i didn't find it actually that entertaining uh it was it was fine you know what i mean it's exactly what you think it would be uh it's golden age sci-fi um that's just not that entertaining. I find this to be the case with a lot of golden age sci-fi. I have others I read in here though that were definitely worth it. I'm not sure that one is. It's cool as a historical piece though. The next one is Jury of His Peers by Michael R. Collins. I believe this one's from 2010. This one's really short as well. Uh, it's kind of horror. Uh, it involves plants and a murder. So that's basically all I have to say about it. I did enjoy it actually, um, but it was very interesting. Uh, uh, something I normally wouldn't read, but... Uh, maybe worth checking out so and then the next one is the shunned house by hp lovecraft this was written in 1924 it was supposed to be published by itself um but it came out in 1937 i believe in weird tales finally um and uh this is actually kind of scary i believe this is the one that I've, i'm in a lovecraft class right now so I'm, i've read a lot of lovecraft but i'm going to mix some of them up probably too um this one involves a vampire um and kind of this um filial bond uh, that is inspired by his relationship with his grandpa. Um, it ends kind of happy compared to most Lovecraft stuff, but it also has some sad stuff going on as well. It, it actually is a good example of character work when Lovecraft is generally um, said to not be very good at character work. Um, and so that's The Shunned House. And the next I have Elminster at the Mage Fair by Ed Greenwood. This one is, book, is story number two in Realms of Valor, edited by James Lauder. It's a Forgotten Realms story. Uh, Ed Greenwood is the creator of the Forgotten Realms. Elminster is like the Merlin or Gandalf of the Forgotten Realms. This is a fun story. It's pretty typical Ed Greenwood Elminster story, 
which means there's immolation, lots of magic, there's lots of hubris, and there's lots of power-hungry mages. Uh, this one is interesting because it's mostly told from the perspective of um, Dove, maybe? I don't know. It's one of the Seven Sisters. I can't remember which one it is exactly. Uh, is the Bard of Shadowdale, so whoever, which one ever that is. Um, so we don't get it straight from Elminster's mouth, which is kind of nice that we get her perspective on these things. Especially since she's not a mage, and she's mostly dealing with mages, of course. Um, and then number the next one, rather, is Scanners Live in Vain. This is another Golden Age sci-fi story. by This one's by Cordwainer Smith, the first story I've ever read by Cordwainer Smith. That's not his actual name. I think he only really ever published short stories under that pen name. I think he published maybe one novel, like, 25 years after this short story. But I think this story might have been what really got him famous. Scanners Live in Vain, uh, probably more of a novella. It's rather long. Um, it's very good, actually. It's very interesting because it's about... Um, going into up and out which is space and in space for some reason uh right this is before they've ever been to space um there's a great pain that for some reason you will just die it's kind of like a ptsd depression actually like type of thing is what it kind of comes off as um, but for whatever reason if you're in space you will die from pain and so the only people who can go up there are these types of people that are basically no longer human because they've had all their feelings cut away from them and there's a special type of these that are called scanners. And these scanners can get all these feelings back on occasion, essentially. And this big thing is that supposedly someone has figured out how to go into the up and out, essentially go into space um, without having to have to be a, be one of these people that doesn't have any feelings, right? Um, you know, other people can actually go to space and live on other planets, potentially, right? Um I thought it was very gripping, actually, very interesting. Uh, and I'm looking forward to reading more by Corbinder Smith. If you have any recommendations on what I should read, uh, let me know. Again, that was 1950. Another um, classic, uh, this is the father of space opera, actually. It was Tedrick by E.E. E. Doc Smith this is 1953. But this is actually not one of his sci-fi stories. I've since read his, for, uh, his sci-fi novel, Triplanetary. But this is actually one of his rare uh, fantasy stories. Um, and I thought it was okay. Uh, there's Tedric, and then there's a sequel, Lord Tedric, which I have not read. Uh, they're probably more novellas again. It's just a little dry, I felt like. Um, it wasn't that entertaining, um, but I thought it'd be fun to read the Father of Space Opera's little fantasy story. Um, it's kind of historical. It seems like it is, but it's. I think everything's made up, like the deities and like the people. So um, it's kind of okay, though. The next one is Cry Witch, with an exclamation point on the very end, by Fritz Leiber. This is 1951. This one is actually one I really enjoyed. It's technically horror. You can find this in like horror bind ups for Liber. Um, and it is essentially about a boy man somewhere that's rather young falling in love um, with this girl who he starts to realize shows up at really random times. Like basically whenever he wants her, right? He Whenever he wants company. Um, and he realizes that she is not exactly as she seems. And in the end, he's going. someone's going to cry witch and there's going to be conversations with death, and it's pretty good. I didn't think it was that scary. It was a little disturbing, maybe, um, a little unsettling for sure, um, but I thought very worth my time. It's not very long either. Uh, so Cry Witch by Fritz Leiber. I'm just a huge fan of Fritz Leiber, um, and it's because of good stories like this. Uh, this isn't even one of his better stories, I feel like, but it's still worthwhile for sure. Um, so Cry Witch, I found, was very worth it. And then the next one is Beautiful Screams by Steve Diamond. I believe this one was not actually um, published until he put it in his collection. Um, it's like, what, Dreamscapes of Hellhounds? I don't know what Hellhounds Dream of or something like that. I can't remember again. Um, but Steve, he's collected all mo most of his short stories and put them in his collection, including ones that had not uh, been published beforehand. And Beautiful Screams was not one of those that had been published beforehand. This is more horror Um it's about a serial killer, essentially. Uh, so take that as you will. Um, not my favorite type of story, but I thought it was well done enough. I mean, it is kind of, it kind of goes as you would expect it would. Um, there's a little bit of a twist, which is like, oh, that's a little surprising, I guess. But um, it's not bad for sure. And it's also rather short, so it's not wasting any time. And then I read Judge D and the Three Deaths of Count uh, Verdenfels by Lavi Tidar. It's a 2021 story. You can read this one on Tor.com for free. Just look it up. Um, this one I didn't enjoy as the, the first Judge D story, um, but it is fun, of course. In the same vein, they're 
quick, easy reads. Uh, I'm looking forward to reading more Judge D, but I haven't yet as of recording this. But Judge D, for those who didn't watch the first video, is a vampire, and he travels with a familiar human, which is named Jonathan, if I remember correctly, and he is a judge of vampires. So he goes around um, meeting out justice to vampires and his idea that vampires, um, well, they're always doing bad things, or at least they're always lying and what forth. So uh, in this case, it's basically the that three people are claiming to have killed uh, this count. And who did it? Well, we'll find out. So uh, number the next one I read is The Dead Man by Gene Wolfe. Um, I actually have this collection next to me too, so I'll show it to you. Um, this is from The Dead Man and Other Horror Stories, um, recently put together by Subterranean Press. Um, I think they made like 500 copies. I got number 58. Uh, Gene Wolfe is a master of sci-fi, I would say. Just about anything. Making you think. He's a master of making you think. Um, and The Dead Man um, is the first story here. It's rather early, actually. So it's a 1965 story. It might be one of his first published stories, if not his first. Um, it's a rather straightforward a story about a dead man. I don't want to spoil it for you, but I think it does a very fun thing, kind of an idea of a trope that we don't see from a certain perspective um, very often at all. Um, so, and then the next one I read is Mother Catastrophes by Aaron and Evans. I believe this is in the collection Champions of At Ataltus, which is a fantasy role-playing RPG, or at least a setting for um, fantasy role-playing RPGs. Um, Aaron and Evans is the author of Brimstone Angels, um, Empire of Exiles and stuff like that. I'm a big fan of hers. Part of the reason why I got this collection. Um, and this one is actually the opening story in that collection, Mother of Catastrophes. It is about um, going into a forest looking some for someone to save someone uh, and kind of how that plays out and how um, kind of following rules, but also making new friends in a way. But it's very like kind of gritty. Uh, there's there's a lot of fantasy cursing. Evans likes her fantasy cursing, which is something I'm a fan of, at least when she doesn't. Uh, so Evans is a good author, and maybe this is a way to be introduced to her. And then next I read The Origin of Snow by Tanith Lee. This is the first time I've read um, Lee. She is rather famous. Uh, this is in the, the collection The Earth is Flat, um, Tales from the Flat Earth, which she had a series of novels which are Flat Earth Tales. And I don't know if this one's ever been published before. So if it hasn't, it's just a 2023 release, uh, which came out like March. But it would have been written quite a while ago. Um, and Origin of Snow is kind of about like these magi-like people, like with making prophecies. And there's a dragon, uh, and there's upper and lower worlds, and there's a demon. Uh, it's pretty interesting, and the idea of snow being kind of related to paper in this case. So I'm very interested in reading more of her flatter stuff, and just more by Lee in general. I have a couple books by her, anyways. So, and then I read the Open Axe by Kirk A. Johnson, which is 2022 release. You can read it in the Open Axe and other other tales of horror heroes and horror or something like that. I don't know. Just look up the Open Axe, which is O B A N A A X. So the cool thing about um, Kirk Johnson here, and actually, this is the first story I ever read by him. I've now read another uh, since reading this, but. Um, he is a Sword and Soul author. Now, for those who don't know what Sword and Soul is, it's essentially Sword and Sorcery. Uh, Sword and Sorcery being typified by Conan. The stories, not the movies so much. Uh, at least I haven't seen the movies, and they're probably not the best way, thing to go off of. Um, the Conan by Robbie Howard. Uh, Fafnir the Grey Master by Fritz Leiber. And Elric by um, uh, Michael Moorcock. Oh, the go-to. C.L. Moore's Jarell Jouari is also pretty good. Uh, Charles Saunders' Imero. Uh, and even with this last one, actually, so Sword and Soil is essentially Sword and Sorcery inspired and set in largely places that are uh, African influence, rather, right? So Kirk A. Johnson takes this, and it's a pretty good story. I liked it, actually. Uh, the Open Axe itself is kind of this jewel that has magical properties of what exactly those are and how they will come about and if they will be used. You have to read about it in the Open Axe. The Open Axe itself is probably more of a novella, though. Um, and I'm definitely looking forward to reading more, even like I said, I already read some more. And I think I enjoy the second story I read by him even more, but I'll talk about that in another video. The next one I read was another one by Fritz Leiber. And then, man, I just, I probably have Fritz Leiber in every one of these episodes because I think I have an episode of one as well. This is Belson Express. This is a 1975 short story by him. Um, so 24 years after Cry Witch. 
Uh, this is in the second book of Fritz Leiber. I think you can read it in its original magazine as well, and I don't remember where it got published exactly. This is actually a good companion, um, and one of my classmates pointed this out to me, to One Day Soon by Lavi Kedar, which I did mention in my last video, which is one of his Haifa um, stories. Um, Belson Express is essentially about a paranoid man who is paranoid of the Gestapo and Nazis um, when he himself is essentially a Nazi, right? He has the same prejudices and he's not very nice. And it's essentially something, again, this idea of that we saw in The Willows with Algernon Blackwood, there's something uh, that's rather mundane, uh, becoming terrifying, essentially, uh, and causing harm, potentially death. So Belson Express about this, um, yeah, anyways, it's it's pretty worthwhile, I think. It's a nice creeping tale about this paranoid man. Uh, so, yeah, anyways, Fritz Leiber, though, is just... I think Belson Express might have won an award. I don't know. Fritz Library just won so many awards, it's hard to remember which ones did and didn't win awards. Uh, so anyways, uh, The Vampire Kiss by Gene Wolfe is um, also, I also read that in the same collection I held up earlier, The Dead Man and other horror stories. The Vampire Kiss is a really simple, like rather Victorian vampire story. I liked it. Uh, it's 2005. It's rather short. Uh, and the next one, Why I Was Hanged by Gene Wolfe is 2011, I believe. Uh, this one is very interesting, actually. It's kind of about, like, astral projection and ghosts and murder and why someone ended up being hanged. I really like this one. Uh, might be my favorite of those three wolf stories I've mentioned uh, for this episode. And then I have... Um, we're getting closer to the end here. Uh, for the Crown by Arthur Gilchrist Broder, or Brodeur, or however you say it. Again, I'll list all these down below. This is a... Fate It in Serkamon story. Uh, this is actually one that doesn't have Serkamon in it at all. Um, in fact, it is um, Fate It, who's really the main character, though I think in maybe some of the other stories, Serkamon is in the stories and not Fate It. Um, and uh, it's Fate It in uh, Thomas Beckett. Um, it's during the 12th century, I believe. Um, and in this case, they're helping the Duke of Normandy. Uh, I believe this is, yeah, the Duke of Normandy against the king of england who oh man i'm totally blanking the king stephen and duke henry maybe um and against like oh, empress matilda um it's i think it's that i think it might be the anarchy period um some english person or someone with better knowledge i i if it was anglo-saxon period which is right before this uh, i would know better but it's very entertaining so faded is a he's not a faded actually and if you know what the word faded is i applaud you um it is a um an Akatan word. Uh, he is from essentially the county of Toulouse. Um, and he is, uh, he was originally like a fisherman, if I remember correctly. They go over this origins in the first story, but it's been a while. And now he is a knight and he's a really well known one, essentially. Uh, he's not a knight, I guess, because he's not nobility, but he's a man at arms, essentially. Uh, and he's really good at his job. Uh, so he, he went into like uh, Moorish Spain in one of the stories. He's been, um, and Northern Normandy, I think the before last story I read, and for the king, if I remember correctly, actually takes place in England. So um, I just really enjoy these stories, Faded and Serkamon. Um, Serkamon is also a um, a, uh, a an Akatan term uh, for a far traveler, if I'm remembering correctly. Faded is a lord that has been displaced, essentially doesn't have his his land anymore. Um, but that's not what Faded is, anyways. So. Um, very, I love these stories. They're just very entertaining. They're very much pulp. Uh, so this story itself came out in 1922 in Adventure Magazine. You can get it in the bind up Faded and Serkamon. Serkamon is C-E-R-C-A-M-O-N. Um, no one's told me how to pronounce that. I'm almost certain I'm saying that correct, though, just based off how uh, the front vowels and back vowels work um, in most Romance languages, or at least French and Akaten. So, um, anyways, I'm talking too much about it. But For the Crown by Arthur Gohars Broder, very good. I like Broder a lot. Anytime I find anything by his, they're kind of expensive sometimes because he's not, they're mostly indie published these days um, for reprints, uh, better than finding the 100-year-old magazine, of course, um, but uh, very good. I'm a big fan of his, to be honest, so uh, if you want some pulp adventure, it's, it's historical fan, it's historical fiction, no fantasy involved, so um, I have a fly in here. It's rather annoying. Anyways, the next one is The Bridge by Larry Crea. This is also in that Champions of Altaltus bind up that the Aaron M. Evans story was in. Um, I wanted to read something by Korea that was a short story because I've read some of his novels and enjoyed those. 
Uh, this one is good. It is about a bridge and someone set to guard it and that man being very stubborn until he is faced with a monk and how that relationship goes. Um, it's kind of predictable. It's still an entertaining read, though, uh, and it is probably worthwhile. So, um, And then One Last Drink by Christy Golden is also in that bind-up of Realms of Valor. It's a 1993 um, bind up, so 1993 story. This is actually about Jander Sunstar, who is a Ravenloft character. Uh, Jander is a sun elf who, for about 500 years at this point, has been a vampire. And in this story, we kind of see some of his origin. It's been a couple hundred years, actually, I think, since he's been a vampire at this point. Um, it's before he goes to Barovia and meets uh, Count Strahd von uh, Zarevich. Is that his name? I think. Um, and uh, it's kind of how he deals with his master, the man who turned the vampire to turn into a vampire, and dealing with that um, and kind of making friends along the way. Um, it takes place in the Dale Lands, um, and I really enjoyed it. I, I'm a big fan of Jander, so yeah. And then I read Sean Below, which I just shared this one in my uh, community tab. Uh, you can listen to this one um, on YouTube. The author reading it as well when she was in like her 70s. But Sean Below by C.L. Moore. Um, from 1933. Now, Farnsworth, uh, what's his name? Whatever Farnsworth, who was the editor for Weird Tales for a long time, um, apparently at one point said that this was the best story they'd ever published in Weird Tales. Um, and Weird Tales had a lot of Robert E. Howard, Carcash and Smith, and H.P. Lovecraft. And C.L. Moore is a very good writer. Um, Sean Blow itself is a Northwest Smith story. Northwest Smith, um, I don't know if you call him space opera exactly, um, but he's a space person. Uh, he is very much the inspiration uh, for Han Solo. Um, you'll see some of these stories later on written by her and her husband, but she was the creator of Northwest Smith. In fact, she wrote the story when she was probably in her 20s, like early 20s, I think, which is insanely impressive because it's such a good story. Sean Blow is kind of sci-fi horror. Um, it's a retelling of the Medusa myth. And it's really well done. It's about a creature named as Sean Blow. Um, so really good. You should go and read it because, uh, again, you can do so for free. Um, I, this is one person I recommend a lot since no one seems to know about her. Um, I don't know if I'd call her, like, the grandmother of fantasy or anything like that because there's fantasy um, authors that are women writing before her. But she's really good. And she was writing in the 30s with some of her contemporaries being some of the big fantasy authors, though people have a tendency not to really look much before Tolkien, and if they are, they're looking at Dunsany or something like that, um, or Edison, maybe, maybe Morris and McDonald, but not really. Um, so C.L. Moore, Catherine with C.L. Moore, you should check her out. Um, I'm a big fan of her Jarello Juari stories as well, which are more sword and sorcery. And then Tit for Tat, um, we're getting near the end here, by Justin Library. his only published short story, 1987, uh, I believe in Amazing, no, no, Astounding. I can't remember. One of those sci-fi magazines. The story actually was okay. It was just kind of boring for the first couple pages. Um, and it has a very interesting ending, though, and it kind of gives you an idea of um, machines, like artificial intelligence machines that like are on our level and how they pair up with humans, kind of in a space catastrophe situation. But again, I didn't think it was actually that entertaining. So, But you get some of Justin Leiber's, who's the son of Fritz Leiber, um, uh, philosophical ideas from him. He was a philosopher. Um, I would prefer that maybe you read his novel Beyond Rejection because you'll get some of the same ideas. But And then I read Herbert West Reanimator by H.P. Lovecraft, which is sometimes considered to be the worst Lovecraft story. I think it's his first, like, uh, um, his first, uh, wow, I can't, professional publication, I believe. It's kind of a parody. It's kind of silly. It definitely has, like, some Frankenstein ideas going on. There's, like, an 80s version of a uh, movie that is pretty popular as far as I'm aware of. It's 1922. Again, it's okay. Uh, the funny thing is I'm reading all these Lovecraft stories and I just simply don't care about most of them. I just read them. I'm like, wow, that was okay. And I've read lots of stories from around that same time period and really enjoyed those. But for whatever reason, maybe it's because Lovecraft is so often imitated. I feel like I've read it before in better form. Um, and maybe that's not fair to Lovecraft, but it's just the way it is. Um, and then also by him was The Nameless City. I actually kind of like this one more because it's more archaeological, has these titanic structures and short alien things. Um, this is a more interesting one. It's not very long either. 
And then last but not least, I have the cyberpunk story I mentioned at the beginning of this. Flame Trees by T.R. Knapper. This is a 2016 story. I believe it appeared in a magazine. I don't remember which one. But you can read it in his Neon Leviathan bind-up. Um, he came out with a novel only last year, 36 Streets, which I have reviewed on his channel, which is a great modern cyberpunk novel. Um, he is an Australian um, author. Um, 36 Streets mostly takes place in Vietnam. Uh, and Flame Trees kind of continues that relationship, or while well, it's older than the novel, so I guess it kind of starts that. Um, and uh, it's about a a Vietnamese man living in Australia, and he is a veteran of this war with China. Um, and he's kind of got PTSD. He's got like survivor's guilt. Um, and it's kind of about him and his memories, if I'm remembering correctly, because um, I read a few of these stories, uh, about him and his memories and whether or not he can keep them because of how they make him feel and how they make him act because of that. Um, and then also about like camaraderie, essentially. Um, it's really good. It's some good cyberpunk. Cyberpunk at its core should make you think, I think, and this does. So that's it. I'll, I will list all these below. Um, let me know if you have any questions. Let me know if you have any re recommendations. Um, no one commented on my last video for these, so maybe it's not that wanted. But if, you, if you're, if you for some reason, at the end of this video, um, and you don't read short stories, um, I think you should. Okay, because short stories give you an idea of concepts in a very tightly packed form. You'll still get character in most of these. You'll still get themes. Um, and they're very easy to get through. Uh, I know they're not fun for some things because no one, hardly anyone reviews short stories, and me included. I'll mention them in my videos, but I don't review them. Um, but... Uh, it's just it's just very fun and very pithy and in some forms actually work better in short short story form i feel for example sword and sorcery is much better as short stories than it is as anything else in my opinion so um and horror in a lot of ways works really good in short stories as well so there's a lot of good stuff you can get from short stories um they're worth checking out uh and they're not insanely long like some of these novels you'll read today and that you need some clout to read a big novel you don't need it just read a short story instead Anyways, uh, Liam from Williams Lyceum, I will catch you next time.